Hi, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. We are starting a little early tonight because of the fact that the word is in that the jury is already back with a verdict. I would never have guessed that. Never, never have guessed that it would be that fast. So I, I saw um, Law and Crime, they're speculating that it could be because they think that it's a, uh, that they have come back with a verdict that says that the that Alec Murdoch is guilty of the murders of his wife and son. I don't think that's necessarily the case. What I'm going to do since, while we're waiting is I'm going to go ahead and start with my planned presentation tonight. What I was going to go ahead and talk about, I'm going to tell you what the defense said in the closing argument. I'm going to tell you about the final rebuttal argument by the state and what they argued. And then whenever it happens, we will break in. I will share my screen with you and we will watch what happens when the jury comes back. I know I've been seeing a lot of people already in the chat. It is nerve wracking and wondering what on earth is going to happen when the jury comes back with Alec, with the verdict in the Alec Murdoch double murders case. So let's go ahead and get started on what I was going to talk about and we, like I say, we'll break in and get to the part that really matters, which is the jury verdict. We had juror drama. Today we had the egg in the court, and we had something about naked golf cart rides. You were just going to have to listen to it all to get what this is going to be, be about. But we started with major juror drama, and it's that juror drama that makes me wonder whether or not the speculation on law and crime that this verdict is guilty, it makes me wonder whether that's correct. One of the jurors was removed from the case and the information we got on that was that the there was a complaint and apparently it was made to the state. You may remember we talked about there was this period of time and they took a sheet of paper up to the judge and we wondered what that was about and then there was the secret meeting they were going to have with the council outside of the presence of the TV cameras. And we wonder what that would be about. Well, now we know it was all about this juror. And what happened was there was a complaint apparently from a member of the public to the prosecution that said the juror had engaged in improper conversations with parties not associated with the case. It sounds like what she had said was that she was leaning against finding Alec Murdoch guilty. That's the thing that gives me pause because if this juror was feeling that way, I don't know whether other jurors may have been feeling that way too. But here's the part we know. A little bit of that was speculation, but we know that the court said that the information about the juror was provided to defense counsel after the court met with the juror on the record and the juror denied discussing the case and provided information the court said that led the court to contact persons she was suspected of having conversations with concerning the case. And they apparently did a full-fledged interview. They did, they did an interview or full-fledged investigation. They did an interview with the witness and then they interviewed the individuals that the witness supposedly talked to. The witnesses, the people being interviewed provided an affidavit and then they brought those two individuals in and had an in-chambers hearing. And the court said both of those individuals waffled on nature, the nature and the extent of the contact with the juror. So the state then provided recorded interviews and interview with the jurors and re reviewed it. And that was really unclear what exactly the court was saying. But what it sounded like was they were saying that the state had provided this recorded interview and later there's going to be an objection from Harputlian that suggests it was done by SLED. So this, the juror, the court said overall the conclusion was the juror had had contact or discussions concerning the case with at least three individuals. It did not appear that they were extensive, but the juror did offer an opinion regarding the evidence received up to that point that the conversation took place. And that juror will be replaced, removed, and replaced by another juror. Now, the defense then stood up and said, well, we don't 
object to your decision in this, your, uh, your judgment on it. But the interview of the juror was done by SLED agents, one of whom was a witness in this case. That is absolutely astonishing. I thought, are, are you kidding? Uh, but apparently when they heard this, SLED said, SLED did an interview of this juror, which I will say was really inappropriate. And the Harputlian just said, look, SLED has made another bad judgment in the case. And told, when he called the, ju the judge, called the juror into the courtroom and said, intentionally, unintentionally, I don't know which, but you had discussions that required me to remove you. He was kind about it. He said, you've been a great, you've been an attentive juror. Thank you for your service. It's not that you did anything intentionally wrong. And then the edge came in because she said, he said, did you leave anything back in the juror room? And he said, well, I, I did, she said, I did, I did bring in a dozen eggs for the other jurors. <laughs> the judge said, well, that, that's new. That's something that I, I haven't had happen before. So he sent somebody to get the eggs for her. I was surprised she didn't want to just leave them for them. You have to hope they were hard boiled and not that she was planning to, I don't know, toss them around the jury room if things went south. But that particular juror from the sound of that was leaning toward the defense and not toward the prosecution. So that's the one thing that makes me think conceivably they went out and said, look, there's just not enough evidence. Typically, an early verdict would indicate a guilty verdict. And so that's, I think, why law and crime is saying that. And they may be correct in this case. What surprises me, there's any verdict. OK, it looks like we're let me uh, take you to my feed on the courtroom. Be seated. I understand that there is a verdict. You may bring the jury. Tips. <laughs> and uh, notice Alec Murdoch. He looks ill. Uh, it can only imagine the pressure at a time like this. I know what it's like for the attorneys, and it's a lot of pressure. So I can only imagine what it would be like for Alec Murdoch. Do a full screen. Yeah, I think I can do that. Um, hmm. There. So we are waiting right now for the jury to come back. So uh, I see in the chat somebody saying it could not be a hung jury. That's correct. <laughs> it definitely could not be a hung jury. They were 100% quickly one way or the other. And typically, a quick verdict like that does favor the prosecution and make it more likely that the jury has gone with the prosecution and found that the defendant was guilty. In this one case, because of that juror who was removed, I mean, that may have been one of the biggest things that ever happened. If this juror comes back with a guilty verdict and that juror was removed, that Thank is you. I'm huge. Thank you. Madam Foreman, if you'll stand for me. Uh, have you reached a verdict? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we have. Is it unanimous? Yes, sir, it is. All right, if you will pass it up to the clerk who will pass it to me. And you may be seated. Stressful. <laughs> she sounded like a guilty jury foreman to me. Not she was guilty, like she was going to say guilty. The defendant will rise. Madam Clerk, you may publish the verdict starting with the back, not with the, let's see, I'll tell you again. Starting with the back, flipping them over one by one.
Docket number 2022-GS-15-00592, the State of South Carolina, County of Colleton, in the Court of General Sessions, in the term of 2022, July, the State versus Richard Alexander Murdoch Defendant, Indictment for Murder, SC Code 16-3-0010, CDR, Code 0116. Guilty verdict signed by the four lady 3223. Docket number 2022 GS 15 00593. The state of South Carolina, County of Colleton, in the Court of General Sessions. The July term of 2022, the state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch defendant, indictment for murder, SC code 16-3-0010, CDR code 0116, verdict guilty, signed by the four lady, wow. date 3-2 of 23. Docket number 2022-GS15-00595. The State of South Carolina, County of Colleton, Court of General Sessions, July term 2022. The State versus Richard Alexander Murdoch, defendant. Indictment for possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. SC Code 16-23-0490. CDR Code 0549, verdict guilty. Signed by the foreperson of the jury. Date 3223. Docket number 2022 GS 15 00594. The State of South Carolina, County of Colleton, Court of General Sessions, July term 2022. The State versus Richard Alexander Murdoch, defendant. Indictment for possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. SC Code 16 23. 0490 CDR code 0549 verdict guilty signed by the four person of the jury 3223 thank you um, madam four lady and members of the jury if that is a verdict of each and every juror please let it be known by raising your right hands all right thank you any individual polling requested? We do not. Madam Clerk, you'll need to individually poll the ju jury according to their jury juror numbers. I tell you, I feel for Buster. He has lost what literally everything. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 22, two, I'm sorry, juror 254. Yes. Is this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 326, was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 6, juror 530, was this your verdict? Yes. Is this your verdict? Yes. Juror 544, yes. was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 572, was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 578, was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 589, was this your verdict? Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 630, was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 729, was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Juror 826, was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Juror 864, was this your verdict? Yes. Is it still your verdict? Yes. Your Honor, the jury has been polled. Thank you. The jury, jury has been polled and the verdict is a unanimous verdict. If you will bring the alternate juror out and have her uh, have a seat in the audience, please.
You can stand there or you can sit back there, whatever you prefer. Okay. Are there any post trial motions? State, Your Honor. We would just renew our previously um, uh, argued motions for a directed verdict. And at this on, on the grounds, <clears throat> on those grounds, we would make a motion for a mistrial and to set aside the verdict. That'll be a no. <laughs> Your Honor, based on our previous arguments, we would submit that the uh, case properly went to the jury and the verdict is proper. I mean, they lost all the other ones. There's zero chance. Uh, we've been here now 28 days, um, first few days of jury selection and the remainder receiving testimony, uh, a, an overwhelming amount of testimony and evidence that was presented to the jury for the jury's consideration. As I indicated to the jury during the jury charge or the charge on the law, that this was a matter solely for jury, the jury to determine. Uh, the court found at the end of the state's case that there's sufficient evidence to find the defendant guilty if the evidence um, was believed by the jury uh, likewise, at the end of the, the uh, defense's case, when the motion was renewed, the court um, found that the evidence was sufficient for the jury to find the defendant guilty. The jury has now considered the evidence um, for a significant period of time, and um, the evidence of guilt is overwhelming. And uh, I deny the motion. The Mr. Murdoch, you now having been found guilty of two counts of murder involving your wife and your son, two counts of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. Uh, the burden now comes upon the court to impose a sentence. Given the lateness of the hour and the victims' rights that must be um, taken into consideration and complied with under the Victims' Bill of Rights, and consider what I would anticipate to be a number of people who might have something to say regarding sentencing, uh, we will defer sentencing to a later date. Of course, the um, minimum sentence for murder is 30 years. The maximum sentence is life imprisonment as to each count. And the on the weapons charge, the sentence is up to five years or five years, um, which has to be concurrent if a life sentence is imposed. When would you all like to uh, reconvene for sentencing? I would like to give everyone an adequate opportunity to prepare, prepare for it. So it'll be ready at 9.30 in the morning, John. Wow. No hesitation there. We could do it at 9.30 tomorrow morning also. All right. The, um, Defendant is remanded to the custody of the um, Colleton County Sheriff's Department. And he may be taken away. So Alec Murdoch has been found guilty on all counts, both the murder of his wife and son, and also the possession of a weapon in the commission of a violent crime. He's facing anything between 30 years and life in prison. The judge will make that decision at a sentencing hearing at 930 tomorrow morning. 
Uh, Madam Can't Foley and members of the jury, I want to thank you on behalf of the citizens of the state of South Carolina and your fellow citizens of Colleton County. Uh, you did not volunteer for this service. You were uh, called upon by the, being summoned to appear and uh, Providence have brought you to this moment in time and these weeks in time. I know that all of you have been here at uh, great sacrifice, uh, particularly the um, juror whose job was on the line until a miracle happened, I guess, that allowed him to be able to leave rather than to stay at rather than leave after uh, two or three weeks. Um, but I want to thank each one of you all individually and collectively. Uh, it's not often that you're called upon to uh, sit in judgment of the actions of your fellow man, but you all responded. And um, it gave due consideration to the evidence. Um, I will make no comment now as to the extent or the overwhelming nature of the evidence, uh, but certainly the verdict that you've reached is supported by the evidence, uh, circumstantial evidence, direct evidence, all of the evidence pointing to only one conclusion, that's the conclusion that you all reached. And so I applaud you all for, um, as a group, uh, and as a unit and individually uh, evaluating the evidence and uh, coming to a proper uh, conclusion as you see, as you saw the law, as you saw the facts. Uh, now that you've served for the next year, you're not eligible to serve again. Now, of course, many people never get called upon, but you're not eligible for the next year and for two additional years uh, you can be exempted from service because no person is required to serve on jury duty in this court more often than once every three uh, years. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9.30, um, we will reconvene for sentencing. Uh, you all have no role in that because that's solely up to the judge, to me. Uh, you're welcome to come back if you want to and be a part of the audience. Uh, if you like. I also want to thank the alternate juror who was locked away in a room by herself for these hours, um, uh, who, uh, who's hung in there during that period of time. I want to thank you as well. Um, Madam Clerk, what do you have to tell your jurors? judge said as well. And I think we can release them tonight and bring them back in the morning. No, they're off duty. They're off jury duty. They they're can duty. they can come they back, can come if, back they if, like. if they like. And you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, typically I've I've seen jurors wanting to see the end result of a case once they've invested a lot into it. It's really an amazing thing uh, with juries. Uh, quite often at the start of the case, jurors are uh, really like, whoa, why am I here? I wish I wasn't selected. We'll cover all this about the purpose, what this will mean for Alec jurors, Murdoch as jurors soon as the judge finishes talking. I really see a lot of questions. To the case and committed to seeing it through um, and are very disappointed when they are not able to see it to a conclusion. And then along the way um, of serving, you end up finding out quite a bit about our judicial system uh, and learning quite a bit, uh, well, about human nature for sure, uh, but also uh, about the presentation of evidence and hearing from expert witnesses and really learning a lot of things that uh, you'll be able to take with you when you leave jury duty. And uh, Madam Forlady, uh, I don't know if you were hesitant initially or not, but you have stepped up to the plate and done a 
great job of leading the jury as well. And thank all of you. So the jury is dismissed. If now one thing before you go, of course, um, we have <clears throat> invested a lot in maintaining the privacy of, of the jury of each one of you. And um, you are free at this point to discuss the case with anyone. And given the high profile nature of the case, I'm certain that the uh, many people in the media would like, will probably want to uh, communicate with you, but they have no means of contacting you because under order that I issued, the identity of the jurors must be kept private. And if um, you decide that you want to speak with anyone, local, state, nationally, or internationally, uh, that's your prerogative. However, should anyone harass you, please let me know and I will address those issues. Uh, if anyone through the somehow or another discover your identity and, and harass you, uh, and rest assured I will intercede on your behalf. That having been said, uh, you are free to communicate with whomever you might want to concerning the case from now on. So with that, thank you, and you all are free to go. Yes. If I could have to go to the jury room, and I'm going to meet you back with just a few minutes. And as is my practice, I'll speak with the four person before you leave the building after talking to them back there. Alec Murdoch found guilty on all counts. We just uh, had the jury read its verdict. Alec Murdoch has been taken back to jail and sentencing will be tomorrow at 930. We're waiting now as the jury leaves and obviously the judge has a little bit more to say. So we'll wait and hear what he has to say. 930 tomorrow morning. Okay, it's just adjourning. We may get some views of people in the courtroom, which would be interesting. So let's hold on just a minute until they take it up to the clock and the seal on the back of the court. And I can tell you from personal experience that this is a very tough moment for the lawyers who have, who have lost. It's a very joyful moment for the lawyers who have won because there has been so much invested in this. And when I say joyful, of course, there's a, I say that with a grain of salt because there's actually a lot of trauma that goes in with this too because of what the nature of the charges was. So, but they have succeeded and won their case. So there's sort of a duality on that, I guess. So um, um, let's go ahead and switch back. You can keep watching, but I'll switch back to a little bit different layout and we can start talking. <laughs> so today we started off the day with some drama and the defense lost the one juror who might have made a difference. The juror was apparently leaning toward the defense. She was called out because she had apparently talked to three different people uh, and stated that she felt like the prosecution was not proving its case against Alec Murdoch. After interviews and talking, and the judge actually had a hearing in which he talked to the people who, to whom the juror had spoken. After all of that, he came back and said, I'm dismissing this juror because it was it's sort of, he said they were waffling on whether she talked to them about it. In other words, I guess maybe they were trying to kind of cover for her, but not real successfully. And so he was saying, I'm going to go ahead and remove that sharing. So he was saying that, that what had been talked about by her, he said, you didn't do anything well, he didn't say you didn't do anything wrong, but he said you didn't do anything intentional. You didn't do anything that you're going to get in trouble for, but I am going to have to remove you from the case. And so that juror who apparently was leaning toward the defense was removed. The rest of the jury clearly came back, no problem 
really quickly for the for the prosecution and found Alec Murdoch guilty on every count. He was found guilty on the count of murder of his son, Paul. He was found guilty on the count of murder of his wife, Maggie. He was found guilty of the possession of a weapon in the commission of a violent crime against Maggie and the possession of a weapon in the commission of a violent crime against Paul. All charges, he was found guilty. And really, really quickly, I think the jury started deliberating at something like 350 and they were back by maybe even before, they were back before seven because we went live a few minutes early tonight because I'd said I would go live as soon as the jury came back. The verdict was um, overwhelming. It was unanimous, of course, but in its overwhelming in its speed. That was really fast. I, I saw somebody saying, Lee, you called it, and I did call it as they would probably come back guilty. The statistics show that that is overwhelmingly true in a criminal case. But I did think it would take longer. I am really surprised. And part of the reason I'm surprised is because as you look at law and crime, as you look at my channel and you see what people are saying, it really seemed to be pretty split between guilty and not guilty or at least not proven. One of the things that, that Jim Griffin talked about in his closing argument today was the fact that in Scotland, apparently Dick Carpootlian traveled there and went to see a trial. That's kind of funny thing to do on your vacation. But he went to a trial on his vacation. And he said that what they found, what they have there is guilty, not guilty, and not proven. And Jim Griffin said to them, in our, our country, we wrap together not guilty and not proven. We put those two together. And so if you think not proven, you have to write down not guilty. He also tried to get them tried to work toward any one juror who would support them. And he, and he tried to work toward that saying, you all have to write this down. You all have to agree with this. And if you personally don't, you need to, he didn't say you need to stand up, but he implied that. He said, if you don't agree with that, then you can't write down guilty. If you don't believe it's been proven. And that was throughout the refrain of the defense was that there was no proof that ultimately there just wasn't evidence that Alec Murdoch was the person who committed the murders. The state gave a very well done rebuttal rebuttal argument by Metters. And he and I, I will say this, I thought every one of the closings was really good and for entirely different reasons. And the re so they were very different. If you watched one, you, you clearly saw something very different from if you saw the second one or the third one. The original closing argument by Creighton Waters was very methodical. He went through everything there was. It was amazingly well done. Virtually no notes that I could see. And he talked for four hours. Remarkable, remarkable. Then there was the Griffin's response. Griffin did pretty much what I had expected. If you saw me on Surviving the Survivor last night, this is even what I said, lots of different little points. Like here's a doubt, and here's a doubt, and here's a doubt, and here's something they didn't have right, and here's proof they don't have. Took it through all of that. And I may look a little bit at that, but in general, that's what he was saying. He was saying throughout all of this, that they just haven't met their burden of proof. There are too many doubts that you ought to have left in your mind. And then Metters did a completely different yet third type of closing, a sort of more traditional type. I bet anything, it was something that you would have expected as a closing argument and neither of the other two maybe was what you were expecting. He just spoke sort of extemporaneously and said, look, this guy is guilty. We all know this guy is guilty. And we can look at, just use your common sense. Just put the things together that you've seen. The time, who else did it? It's obviously Alec Murdoch. He was there within minutes of the time that they were murdered. He had the exact kind of gun that they were murdered with, even though we didn't find it. He manufactured this alibi. He went through all of those things and said, 
in, in a more impassioned way and said, speaking very plainly, go ahead, vote guilty. And clearly that's what happened with the jury. Clearly that's exactly what happened. The jury went all the way for this. So Nika Dimitro is saying, okay, what would your vote have been? You know, I think it may be being a lawyer, but I, I am, I would have listened to other people in the jury room, but boy, I think it was really, really close on whether the state met its burden of proof. I, I felt like several things that they did really hurt them, but we'll go through that. I think let's go through and talk about it. And I'll tell you where I would have been open maybe to discussing that with other jurors, but they were concerns that were pretty big for me that I really did want answered and the state didn't answer those. So just so, to sort of recap for people just now joining us, the Alec Murdoch was found guilty, all four counts. He is going to be sentenced tomorrow morning at 930. The judge said, I'll defer sentencing. How long do you need to prepare? There will probably be witnesses because normally you would have family members who would come in and testify about how much they had lost and you might well have friends and that's difficult to put together quickly, but the state didn't seem particularly concerned about it. They said, we'll be ready at 930 in the morning. The judge said, okay. So the what is he facing? 30 years to life in prison for each count of murder, Maggie and Paul, and then five years for the weapons charge. And that runs, if he's given life, that runs concurrently with it. So you can't have life plus five. The So the throughout what we are seeing is, well, I think clearly the judge believed the jury got to the right conclusion. The judge made some kind of comment like, I, I won't, I won't say it's supported right now. I won't comment on the overwhelming nature of the evidence, which is sort of an indication that he thought the evidence against Murdoch was overwhelming. And there were several indications throughout the trial where I kind of got that as well. And he said, but I will applaud you for your decision. And clearly it was supported. It was at least supported and I will applaud you. So it's, I, I think his, clear demeanor was, I think the guy was guilty and I think he reached the right conclusion. I think that's what the judge would have would have thought based on what he was saying. The sentencing will happen tomorrow morning at 930. Of course, we will go live and we will watch as the sentence is delivered to Alec Murdoch. If it's a long hearing and I don't really know what the plan is, we may or may not I mean, if it's an all-day thing, we may not stay live the whole time. But if it's a shorter affair, then we'll be live until the sentence is actually delivered. You can see from Alec's demeanor tonight, he was very stoic. He was not reacting in any way to it. Um, he seemed upset. I would say clearly upset, but he did not cry. He didn't reach emotionally. Buster, on the other hand, was also pictured beside him and you could see Buster cover his face a couple of times and sort of grab his face. And I can only imagine what all of this is like for Buster. Because when you think about it, Buster has lost his mother and his brother and now his dad has been convicted of killing the two of them and is going to jail. He's lost the family money, the family name. He was kicked out of law school. It's absolutely remarkable what he's lost. And so I can only imagine what his what he feels like and what his reaction to it was. They, he was the only person they showed in the jury room. I don't know if John Marvin, Randy, the sister, I don't know who else was there. They didn't I didn't see anyone else visibly on the feed. We also didn't see anybody that I recognized from the trial, they only showed Buster. So it was even difficult to see the attorneys or what their reactions were throughout this. The, some people have asked about, what about the financial crimes? Those will be tried separately. And naturally I will report on all of that because it also was extremely interesting, but there's a good chance, I think, that those cases will be a plea, that he will just plead guilty and there will be some kind of negotiated agreement on what he will face. That he will face both state and federal charges. We know federal because the state tax evasion charges have 
already been brought and we can bet that the federal will follow closely. We also can bet that because of the fact that Russell Lafitte has already been convicted federally and Alec Murdoch was charged with doing the same kinds of crimes, although he did not work directly for the bank. So that does change to some degree what exactly he would be guilty of federally. He probably will be charged with something in connection with the Russell Lafitte issues where there, there was an appointed conservator and funds were taken from the accounts of people who were supposedly being protected by Russell Lafitte or by another conservator there at the bank. And the, the questions, of course, will be for whether or not Alec Murdoch is guilty is what he knew and what was taken from the bank federally. That'll be the question. What exactly was taken from the bank? Russell Lafitte was accused of uh, crimes that involve stealing from the bank where he was the president or CEO. I've forgotten exactly his title. So all of that is still to come. These financial crimes, however, I, I, if I were a betting woman, I'm going to say tomorrow the judge clearly says life in prison for each crime plus the five years, but they'll run concurrently. That's what's going to happen with the sentencing tomorrow. And then with that sentencing, there's not a lot left to add. I don't know the answer to whether or not there would be a potential for parole if you have life in prison. Is there is that just the way it is or is there still a chance for parole? But so many years are going to be added on to this. So many years are going to be added on that we'll talk about for uh, he has 99 other financial crimes. We're not talking about just a few, 99 of them. I would be really surprised if he gets out of jail, certainly until he's very, 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 very old. I, I imagine he will not get out of jail at all. I imagine that this is, in in the end, a life sentence for him. So that would be my guess. Now, Buster's life just changed again. Someone's saying, yes, I'm going to go back through and ask, does South Carolina have parole for life in prison? I have that question too, and I don't know. I may check with the South Carolina lawyer. We may get somebody on and see what they have to say about it. So let's see. Let's take a look at some of the questions. Um, let's see. What are you going to write in Terminal Lands? Oh, he's just talking to somebody else. Okay. Like, I don't know. I don't know that one. Will we ever find out what happened to the clothes and the gun? No. That'd be my guess. No. I suppose there's a remote chance Alec Murdoch would write a book from prison in which he revealed everything since it wasn't a death penalty case and since he's going to i feel like get the maximum in prison he won't get any money for it probably well it would i suppose go to the estates of maggie and paul which then would probably go to buster so who knows but i don't think he would ever do that and that's the only way i know of unless they just happened to come across him there was a rumor and and in fact reports at the time that sled had actually gone and dredged the river near the parents' house and they were looking for something related to the Murdoch case, but they didn't find anything. So at this point, I just have to assume, no, there's not going to be anything that's going to come out that's going to be significant. So I want to take a look at what some of the things that were argued today were. And that these are things I'll, I'll talk about it from the defense perspective, and then I'll talk about it from what happened in the final rebuttal argument by the state. And clearly the jury went with that. The jury has now convicted Alec Murdoch on all counts. The point of the defense was to create the idea that there was at least some reasonable doubt. And they started with that reasonable doubt. And they said, he gave a football analogy, you know, the play on the field stands unless there's visible evidence that it's wrong. And in our case, the play on the field is innocent. The jury clearly did not buy that, didn't buy it and said, each of you is going to have a vote. Come on. I, every single person has to believe this. 100% they did. And they even polled the jury and all 12 said, yes, that's my verdict. And the sus the, he talked about the fact that Alec Murdoch was fairly quickly assumed to be the person. The fact that the very next day, he started almost with this, the very next day, Sled put out that press release where Sled said, 
in conjunction with Colleton County, there's no danger to the public. And the defense said that's because they already thought it was Alec Murdoch. They weren't really looking for the other people who really did that. And overall, what Jim Griffin, I think, said effectively, but clearly not effectively from the jury's perspective, was he said, why? Why would he do this? Why, 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 why? He said more than once. He said, what is the reason for it? He said, the reason they say is that he was going to lose everything financially and all of this house of cards was falling down. He had two responses to that. First, he said his house of cards wasn't really falling down. It was just an ordinary day. After all, while Jeannie Seconder taught him about it, about the Ferris fee that was missing, at the time, Jeannie Seconder just thought all he was trying to do was hide funds. She didn't think he was stealing funds. And furthermore, as soon as he said his dad was in the hospital, she changed and said, oh, I'm so sorry. And the defense said, how much did he really have to fear some deep investigation by her that would require that would cause him to go out and kill his wife and son? That was the so he said, where's the motive here? There's no real difference in the way he was approaching things. There was nothing dramatic that was happening. He'd had the same hearing scheduled twice before in terms of the boat case, and he hadn't killed anybody either time. So what made this hearing different? There was nothing going on in his life that would cause him to suddenly kill his wife and son. There's no reason. And here was one big turnaround that may have been quite effective for the prosecution. He said, actually played the kennel video. I was stunned. The defense played the kennel video. But he said, look, they, everybody seems kind of relaxed and calm. The prosecution then took it up, Metters, in that very different style of closing argument. And Metters said, did you hear the way he said, Bubba, Bubba, come here. He said, he doesn't sound happy and free, free. It's not like just a casual family night. He sounds angry. He sounds like he's kind of angry. And the truth was that that is a good point. He did sound it, although it was angry at the dog, not angry at Maggie, not angry at Paul. And Maggie seemed very lighthearted. She was like, oh, he's got a chicken. And everybody seems pretty lighthearted. But I will say, I thought that was pretty well done by Metters to say, listen closely. He says, Bubba, and he's kind of mad. And Betters talked about the three witnesses who spoke loudest of all. And one was Paul, one was Maggie, and one was Bubba. And he said, Bubba was, as, was barking. And maybe that showed something about what Bubba knew about Alec's real demeanor and how Alec was really acting. Since we don't get to see a video of Alec at the time. We only see a video of the dog that, for Cash, Cash the dog, and we see Paul's feet working with Cash, and that's all we see. So the prosecution said, look, this timeline is so finite. This is, he's there, he lied about it, he lied about being there, and he was there within minutes of the time they were killed. The defense said, look, minutes of the time they were killed. What you really mean is minutes of the time that they stopped using their phones. Now that's different. And I, I, as I was watching another broadcast earlier, I saw some younger reporters who were talking about that and they were, they were saying, well, he wasn't using his phone. That would mean he was dead, right? I think there may be some differences age-wise in that. I, I was less surprised than they were that he would not use his phone. But the prosecution said the big difference is how often this family used their phones. Paul regularly responded quickly. He did that all the time. And Maggie used her phone. She was reading something shortly before this. So the fact that both of them suddenly stopped doing what they typically did was a big red flag. That shows us there was a reason for that. And the state kept saying, look, we don't have to explain motive. We don't have to do that. We don't have to say why it happened. We just have to say that it happened and we have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. And he said, use your common sense, take your common sense back there. And if you think based on everything you've seen, 
yeah, he did it. Then you need to convict him and you need to find him guilty. So I'm very curious uh, right now what people are thinking about the verdict of guilty on all accounts. What are you thinking? Are there people who are thinking miscarriage of justice? He should have been found not guilty because the state didn't prove its case. Are there a lot of people or few thinking guilty, glad? I've seen both running through, it looks like, but I'm really curious what you're thinking. So please put that in the chat because I'd like to know what you're thinking about this. And the question he t that Griffin talked about, the why, 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 was so important because what he was saying was, here, you've got the dad going to the hospital already. Why is this suddenly a good time to kill Paul, to kill Maggie? people he loved. And Matter said, I, I wrote this down because I thought this was really good. He said, I think he loved Maggie and Paul, but you know who he loved more than that? He loved Alec. That was very powerful, I think. Clearly, it was very persuasive to the jury. Clearly, that closing argument, because they quickly went right through it and came back with a very, very fast guilty verdict. And I see, yeah, this is what I figured. People saying guilty, people saying not guilty. I would say it's probably a more guilty. And I think that's sort of what I, what I picked up earlier too. But it was, I think, a close case, but not close in the minds of 12 jurors in Colleton County. You have to wonder what effect it would have had if that one juror had not been removed just this morning. There was an argument from Dick Harputley, and not really an argument. He said, I'm not objecting to your removing this juror, but I am arguing that SLED messed up again because SLED went in, including using one of the SLED officers who testified at this trial, and SLED is the one who interviewed the juror and said that's wildly inappropriate, basically, and that should never have happened, and this is another mistake by SLED. Now, what about appeal? It's early to talk about that. Obviously, the defense will appeal. Criminal appeals, in fact, all appeals, rarely, rarely, rarely win, and that's even more the case in on the criminal side than on the civil side. In this case, the judge went way far out on the issue of letting in the financial crimes that is almost surely where they're going to go. They will argue that those financial crimes should not have been let in, at least not to the extent they were. Now, of course, by now, Alec Murdoch has gotten on the stand. The judge said repeatedly that he opened the door to a lot of the things that he talked about, and that will be the argument the state will bring. Not only was it relevant to his motive and the jury bought that it was relevant to his motive, but in addition to that, he opened the door repeatedly, and that's what they'll say throughout the appeal. Now, let's go a little bit more into what Metter said. His, he talked about the fact the two of them disagreed. Griffin said, okay, law enforcement really, really screwed up here. They did a lot of stuff that was wrong, and he said, furthermore, he accused them directly of having manufactured evidence in the case or lied about what evidence they had. He named three specific things. Let me go through my notes here. <laughs> I had 21 pages of notes from today's closing arguments. I am such a nerd. Uh, so he said three things that he, I may not be able to find him quick enough. Oh, well, I'll go back to what Metters was saying. So Metters was saying, okay, it's offensive to say that law enforcement didn't do their job because look at what Alec Murdoch was doing. He was withholding evidence. He was withholding the information that might have helped them the most, the fact that he was there moments beforehand. So it's really offensive to say law enforcement didn't do their job when you're lying. And what, the, and what Griffin said was, look, you told the grand jury three things. Hopefully I can remember them since I'm not spotting them in my massive notes here. He said the, he said the things... You told them there was gunshot residue on the shirt. That was false because as the testing turned out, no gunshot residue on the shirt at all. Zero for 74. And he said, and you you also told them, eh, I really am going to need my notes. 
Hmm. Somebody quick, write it in the comments. You'll probably remember. He went through the things that, oh, I'll do my search. <laughs> Someone's writing, please. Here, let me do my search. So, okay, he talked about the fact that everything they had told them in the grand jury, three of the four had been proven not, not correct. And the fourth one, he said, we're back to the lie. That's a really hard thing for a defense lawyer to say. He said, okay, these three didn't pan out. You told the grand jury that those didn't pan out. The fourth, we're back to the lie. The fact that Alec Murdoch said he wasn't at the kennels back of the house, taking a nap. And he was. And the question comes, did he screw up by getting on the stand? Did he mess everything up because he got on the stand? Was that something that undid it? And honestly, I don't think it probably made a difference. If anything, I think he had a chance to connect with the jury and to say, I did not kill Maggie and Paul. But the real issue was going to be there no matter what. The issue of the lie, the issue of whether or not he had actually been at the kennels and lied about it was going to be there because they had the kennel video. That was what ultimately convicted him. That was the thing that made all the difference for Alec Murdoch. And that was going to be true whether or not Alec Murdoch said it on the stand or whether they simply put the kennel video up. Either way, that was going to be true. So I'm looking through for my grand jury part because I did think this was a really good point. Ah, the, told the grand jury that there were four shotguns at the house loaded with buckshot and birdshot. So that matched the, what was used in killing Paul. And Griffin said, well, that part wasn't true. That just was untrue. And so you're being very hard on Alec Murdoch, like, okay, he got this amount of time wrong and that amount of time wrong. But you yourself made mistakes and you're okay with that. You say, that's okay. That's just a mistake. But when he makes a mistake, you're much more serious about it. But ultimately he came back to, and this is almost an exact quote. So we are left with the lie. And why did he lie? And that's certainly a fair question. That's always a position from behind the eight ball. When you've got to say something like that, that's really, really hard. So, and the third thing he said that was, they lied to the grand jury about was that the rain jacket, it, while the rain jacket found at the parents' house did have gunshot residue, he said, it, there's no evidence that it was connected to Alec. And indeed that evidence did really fall apart, I think, at the trial. But the kennel video, and many people have said, that's kind of Paul. That's Paul being the little detective, if you will. That's Paul being the person who ultimately cracked the case because he took the video and he took the video that said that Alec Murdoch was really at the kennels because his voice was in the background when Alec Murdoch said he wasn't. There was already testimony or at least a statement from Rogan, the friend of Paul, who said, I thought I heard Alec in the background there. And what Metter said is that would have been pushed aside. Alec would have said, oh, well, and did say, and did say, Rogan was just mistaken. I wasn't there. He just, you know, he heard that wrong. But he could not say that about the kennel video because everybody could hear that. So he would have pushed aside, Metter said, Rogan's testimony, Blanca's testimony, and Shelly Smith's testimony. Said, if we didn't have this proof, he was going to slip away, slip away on all of these issues. And so I, I see more questions about, do, you, do I think they got it right? I think it was a very hard case. I think they did a good job. And I would ultimately, I would say, I wouldn't second guess it. I found it a very, very difficult case. I think there was less proof and it was less certain. But boy, the prosecution really crunched that timeline so tight. It really did make the fact that Alec Murdoch lied about being at the kennels so important because you could see that he was that he lied about that and it was within minutes of the time that they were killed and after you began to see that and how close in time it was it became awfully convenient 
that he wasn't there and that he wasn't there and wasn't the person who was responsible for that. So do I think they got it right? I, I definitely wouldn't second guess that because I think this was a really hard case. I think they listened carefully. Also, they did see some things we didn't see in terms of the autopsy photos and things that weren't shown to the public. I want to say thank you to Karaoke Tube for the super sticker. Thank you. Oh, 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 this is so important. <laughs> I absolutely want to tell you this. Do you remember when I said it? I think I said it on this show, but I may have said it on Surviving the Survivor or both. We had all of that testimony from the Dr. Reamer who talked about the fact that she felt like the shot went on oh, Paul, went from here to here, out here. And we had all the testimony from the defense experts who said the opposite. The gun against the head, down through the cheek, out through the shoulder. Remember all of that? And I, I finally said, uh, okay, I've listened to this. I know all the arguments, you know, the blood at the top. I know the arguments about why it went this way. But why? Why do I care? I don't understand why I care. And I've listened. I've listened really carefully. But how does this make it any clearer that Alec Murdoch was or was not the murderer? I mean, how does the shot coming from this direction mean Alec had Alec was responsible? But if the shot came from this direction, there's no way Alec Murdoch did it. And I thought, I don't. I just don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand that. And I, I said that. Well, today Griffin finally answered that. And what he said was, it didn't matter. He actually said that. None of that mattered. And the reason it didn't matter, apparently, the the defense was trying to make that argument because they wanted to say that the shooter was so close when they shot Paul that they would have been covered with blood spatter and they, the gun would have been had blood bloody material on it. And since Alec Murdoch did not have bloody clothes, did not have bloody shoes, did not have a bloody gun. It wasn't Alec Murdoch. Alec Murdoch couldn't have been the person. That was what the defense wanted to argue. And since on her in her reply, in her rebuttal testimony, Dr. Reamer said the shooter from her direction also would have gotten blood spatter on them. It didn't matter. <laughs> really? And I, I honestly think, if that was what it was about, that really should have been clear. And it was absolutely not clear. So I want to say thank you to S. Watkins. I appreciate that very much. This has been, I think, a really interesting case to cover because of the fact that there was such a specific timeline that was built even during the course of the case because the OnStar data from GM came in in the middle and both sides had to adapt and parts of it helped the defense and parts of it helped the prosecution. There was, for example, the one minute pause on the driveway leaving Almeida and what happened there? Could Alec Murdoch have been hiding evidence? The fact that, I, too, that was a mistake. I think Alec said, having been confronted with this years later, that he suddenly remembered on the way out of Almeida, he dropped his phone between the side of the seat and the center console of the car. Who would remember that two years later? I thought that was very, I said at the time, really? Come on. He also, the OnStar data showed, drove around to the back of the house instead of staying on the driveway in the front. Prosecution said today, and Metter said in his final closing, that what he was doing was hiding evidence in those buildings at the back of the property. And that's why he drove around to the back. Buster got on the stand and said, oh, we went around to the back all the time. We went around to the back because of the fact that if you knocked on the front door, since the bedrooms were in the back, nobody could hear you. So we typically drove to the back and went in the back door where they could hear you knock. That Buster then, so Buster supported his dad in that. When Alec got on the stand, he said the same thing. He said that he drove around to the back and that that's why he drove around the back was to let have them let him in. The OnStar data also had some support for the defense, though, showing a couple of things. One, that he really did drive directly over to Almeida without stopping somewhere along the way to dispose of evidence. And then it was pretty questionable about he didn't directly slow down right where the phone was. And the 
defense spent a lot of time today talking about the throwing out of the phone and the fact that the times that the phone, Maggie's phone lit up, didn't correspond with the times when Alec Murdoch was driving. They didn't, and nothing matched. Like Alec Murdoch's moving and her phone is being changed from orientation wise, but not being used. And they said he knew her password. Why would he not have just responded? Like if he wanted to create an alibi, why wouldn't he, if he's going to call Maggie, just answer the phone? Hey, Alec, how you doing? Doing great. How about you? Going to my mom's. Okay, fine. Why not do that? Because that way it would show on both sides. Why not have answered it? Why not respond to Alec's text? Okay, hon, have a great night. Why not do that? And the fact the defense argued that he didn't do that is evidence that he wasn't the one who had the phone. Somebody else had the phone. Ultimately, obviously, the jury didn't buy it. The jury came back unanimously against Alec Murdoch on all four counts. So I'm going to, I'll look for a few questions. If you've got any questions, put those in the comments. Tomorrow, sentencing at 9.30 in the morning, we'll go live and watch the sentencing together and talk about it. I feel really, really confident that the judge is going to award, is going to assign the maximum sentence to Alec Murdoch. He is going to give him life in prison. He's going to do that on both counts. He's going to give him the five years running concurrently with the life sentence for the murders. And that, that'll be for his possession of a weapon in the commission of a violent crime. So that's what I think will happen tomorrow. I think we will, but we're getting that answer really fast. It's often a significant amount of time before we get any feedback on what the sentence will be. I mean, it can be months while they plan a hearing and have witnesses come in and talk about the impact to people in the community, the impact to the family. In this case, of course, Alec Murdoch is the closest family except for Buster. And they're definitely not going to put Buster on the stand, I don't think. But the defense might, but not, I don't think, Creighton Waters or the prosecution. So, But they could have Maggie's sister. They could have Maggie's family. It may take a little bit for them to get that together. So we'll go on at 9.30. What we'll do is just talk about the case at 9.30. If it's going to be a full-fledged hearing, we'll probably go for about an hour, I guess, and then we can break and I won't, I mean, I will have to see kind of what the hearing is shaping up to look like. But if it looks like it'll be fairly brief and contained, we'll do that. If it's going to be either a full day or a multi-day affair, obviously we won't go all day. We'll break and we'll start over. This has been an unbelievable ride. <laughs> I really enjoyed this case. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your comments and appreciate your watching. It's been so much fun for me to follow this case. So I will see you at 930 when we will hear the rest of the story and we will find out more about exactly what will happen to Alec Murdoch. So I will see you tomorrow.